correct? Yes. Okay, and we're gonna get started. Give me one second, Lucia. We'll just get um like get leave uh, people some time to to hop on. Okay. No problem. All right, we got some folks coming in. We're just gonna wait a couple more minutes. See so if you just want to let folks know that we're waiting a couple minutes. Sure. We'll Welcome, started. everyone. We'll be getting started in a few minutes. We're just allowing some time to uh, have other uh, people join in. So just uh, one or two more minutes and we'll get started. Thank you. We can get started whenever you're ready. Thank you, Lucia. All right. Thank you, yes. Welcome to Senate District 8, Senator John Brooks webinar. As we celebrate Women's History Month, Issues Facing Women lecture series. In honor of Women's History Month, Senator Brooks is hosting a lecture series for the entire month of March regarding issues facing women. Our office is collaborating with local experts and professionals to provide a virtual space to discuss and explore various topics related to women. So with that, we would like to welcome you. Thank you for joining us this evening. And just some quick features uh, in case um, we have um, different buttons that you could use during the, this evening. We have the chat which is um, you're welcome to use um, any commands in the chat to share any comments or any links. And we also have the Q&A, which can be used to submit questions that will be addressed at the end. And we have the raise your hand option, which you can use if you have any issues with the audio or video. Again, thank you. Um, at this moment, it is my privilege and honor to introduce to you our Senator John Brooks, uh, thank you, Senator Brooks, for always um, having this wonderful webinars available to our community. Thank you and welcome. Uh, good evening uh, to everybody. Thank you, uh, Lucy. Um, tonight and the, throughout the month, we have uh, a, a very important month, women's history. Uh, obviously, um, you know, women have contributed tremendously to this nation and um, historically and in today's common day. And, and this month we're, we're going to uh, concentrate on issues that are facing women at these times by experts that we were able to bring from the community. So um, not being a woman, I, I cannot address the women's issues, uh, but we do have an expert that's gonna do that. And uh, I kidded with the group beforehand a little bit um, but um, this is important. Um, you know, women uh, in, in many cases in the, in the workplace and others have, have faced a number of issues. Uh, uh, trying times as a result of the pandemic uh, in particular, uh, we had many challenges we had to face. Uh, and during the course of, of this month, we, we hope to discuss some of those issues. So. Uh, I welcome you this evening, and uh, like some of the others, I'm going to sit back and enjoy it. Thanks. Go ahead. Thank you, Senator Brooks. Again, tonight is our kickoff, and um, with our first lecture, our co-host um, by Dr. Lori Prosakis from mm -hmm. Farmingdale State College, um, entitled The Yellow Wall Pair, uh, Paper. Um, it is my privilege again and honor to welcome you, uh, Dr. Lori Rosakis. Uh, just to give you a little bit of her background, um, she earned her BA and MA from Hofstra University and her PhD from SUNY uh, Stony Brook. And she is a full professor 
a full-time professor of English and Humanities at Farmingdale State College, winner of the Prestige Chancellor Award for Excellence in Teaching. Dr. Rosakis has published over 100 books and scores of articles. Her publications include trade books, young adult books, textbooks, biographies, reference books, articles, and scholarships. Her favorite book includes Zombie Light Notes, The Undead Ate My Brain, and Now I Need This Study Guide to Help Me With My Homework. The Complete Idiot's Guide to Grammar and Style to Second Edition and the, and the um, Portable Jewish Mother Adams. And Dr. Rosakis frequently appears on national TV, uh, including uh, Live with Regis and uh, Kelly, the CBS Morning Show, the Murray Povich Show, Fox Good News, New York uh, Metro Relationship, and Fox Personal FX. She has been quoted in scores of newspapers and magazines, including Newsday and Times, the New York Post, the Daily News, the Sacramento Bee, Glamour, Seattle Post Intelligencer, the Chicago and the Tribute, the Chicago Tributes. So I am really delighted to introduce to you Dr. Lori Rosakis. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here with us tonight. Welcome. Well, thank you, but I first must say, I'm the one who feels tremendous gratitude, and it's really an honor that Senator Brooks reached out. Um, I admire him tremendously for the work that he has done for the community, and I'm humbled to be part of this, and, and I thank him very, very much for all that he does for us all of the time. He and I were at a uh, an event the other day, and, and um, he was fabulous. Okay, so let's see if I can make this happen but I know I've got, okay, all righty, okay. Is this working? Can you guys see my screen? Uh, no, we don't. Okay, so can I ask you uh, to do it for me? Okay, give me one second, all right? Um, you can go ahead and, and, and if you wanna start telling us a little bit about the yellow wallpaper, why I get that up, right? Okay, all righty, and you let me know when you get it up, okay? Okay. I'm going to start with what is the story about? The Yellow Wallpaper is a series of diary entries written by an unnamed woman who is suffering from nervousness following childbirth. Her husband, John, a doctor, has put her on the rest cure and rented a beautiful estate for the summer to help her recover. So this is a short story in the form of a series of diary entries. John's sister, Jenny, also lives with them and serves as their housekeeper. John insists the narrator will get better if she rests and does nothing at all, but she believes that her work, writing, and socializing will make her feel better. She thinks there's something strange and mysterious about the house which has been empty for some time, but John dismisses her ideas. She complains that John treats her as a child and ignores her concern. To quote from the story, she says, I will proudly declare there's something queer about this house, else why should it have been let so cheaply? Let meaning um, how come it costs us so little to get it? And why should it have stood so long untenanted? John laughs at me, of course, but one expects that in a marriage. Okay, continuing. She especially dislikes the room that John has chosen for them, the former nursery, as it has ugly yellow wallpaper, bars on the windows, and a bed nailed to the floor. The wallpaper is stripped off in great patches all around the room. In houses such as this, the children would have their own room, normally on a separate floor, and it was called a nursery. And in that room would be the children and their private nurse. And the children would be brought down perhaps once a day, maybe not even once a day, as the parents went about their business. She wants to move to a nicer room downstairs, but John refuses. 
the longer she stays in the room, the more the wallpaper repels and fascinates her. John is often away from the house, even at night. This means he is usually not even staying in the same room as the narrator, even though that was the reason he gave the narrator for choosing the yellow wallpapered room in the first place. And to quote from the story, she says, so I take phosphates or phosphites, whichever it is, and tonics, and journeys and airs and exercise until I'm absolutely forbidden to work until I am well again. Personally, I disagree with their ideas. Personally, I believe that congenial work with excitement and change would do me good. But what is one to do? After hosting the family for July 4th, the narrator feels even worse. As her mental state deteriorates further, John encourages her to rest even more. Nonetheless, she continues to write, but hides her writing from him because he disapproves of it. The floor is scratched and gouged, and the plaster is dug out in places. But it is the wallpaper that obsesses the narrator. She sleeps all day and stays up all night staring at the wallpaper, believing it has come alive. To quote from the story, that spoils my ghostliness, I'm afraid, but I don't care. There's something strange about this house. I can feel it. I even said so to John one moonlight evening, but he said what I felt was a draft and he shut the window. I get unreasonably angry with John sometimes. I'm sure I never used to be this sensitive. I think it's due to this nervous condition. But John says, if I feel so, I shall neglect proper self-control. So I take pains to control myself, before him at least, and that makes me very tired. I don't like our room one bit. I wanted one downstairs that opened to the piazza and had roses all over the windows and such pretty old fashioned chintz hangings, chintz is a fabric, but John would not hear of it. He said there was only one window and not room for two beds and no near room for him if he took another. She stares at the wallpaper and she sees the patterns writhe and change. Quoting from the story, there are things in the paper that nobody knows but me and ever will. Behind that outside pattern, the dim shapes get clearer every day. It is always the same shape and only very numerous. Uh, Lucy, have you guys been able to see the slides? Yes, the slides okay. are yeah. perfect. The pattern begins to take shape. And it is like a woman stooping down and creeping about behind the pattern. I don't like it a bit. Further, the faint figure behind seemed to shake the pattern just as if she wanted to get out. Terrified, the narrator begs her husband to take her away from the house, but he dismisses her concerns. Bless her little heart, said he with a big hug. She shall be as sick as she pleases. The narrator begins to feel better because she's busy watching the woman in the wallpaper. Life is very much more exciting now than it used to be, she says. You see, I have something more to expect, to look forward to, to watch. I don't want to leave now until I have found it out. There is a week more, and I think that will be enough. She perceives that the wallpaper has a peculiar smell. She says, it used to disturb me at first. I thought seriously of burning the house to reach the smell. But now I'm used to it. 
The only thing I can think of is that the smell is like the color of the paper, a yellow smell. She notices a funny mark on this wall, low down, near the mop board, a streak that runs around the room. It goes behind every piece of furniture except the bed, a long, straight, even smooch, as if it had been rubbed over and over. The reason it doesn't go behind the bed is the bed is nailed down to the floor. She wonders how it was done and who did it and what they did it for. Round and round and round, round and round and round. It makes her dizzy. She says, sometimes I think there are a great many women behind and sometimes only one and she crawls around fast and her crawling shakes it all over. And she is all the time trying to climb through. I think that woman gets out even in the daytime. I have seen her. The narrator locks the door when she creeps around by daylight. She can't creep at night because she knows that John would suspect something. She rips at the wallpaper as she creeps. A few weeks before they are to leave the house and return home, John stays overnight in town. As soon as the moon rises, the narrator pulls and pulls at the wallpaper to remove it and free the woman trapped underneath. She doesn't like to look out the window because, quote, there are so many of these creeping women and they creep so fast. John returns and frantically tries to get the narrator to unlock the door, but she refuses. She has thrown the key out the window. John gets the key and finally enters the room to find the narrator is crawling around the wall. She claims that the woman in the wallpaper has finally been freed saying, I got her out at last in spite of you and Jane. And I pulled off most of the paper so you can't put me back. The end of the plot. Okay. John, dear, I said I in the gentlest voice. The key is down by the front steps under a plantain leaf. That silenced him for a few moments. Then he said very quietly indeed, open the door, my darling. I can't, said I, the key is down by the front door under a plantain leaf. Then I said it again, several times, very gently and slowly, and said it so often that he had to go and see, and he got it, of course, and came in. He stopped short by the door. What is the matter, he cried, for God's sakes, what are you doing? I kept on creeping just the same, but I looked at him over my shoulder. I've got out at last, said I, in spite of you and Jane, and I pulled off most of the paper so you can't put me back. Now, why should that man have fainted? But he did, right across my path by the wall, so I had to creep over him every time. And that is the end of the story. What does this story mean? How does the story relate to Women's History Month? Senator Brooks gave me free reign and he and his staff encouraged me to do what I thought would be relevant to the audience. So that's why I picked this story. First interpretation was a Gothic horror tale. When the story was published in 1892, it was perceived as nothing more than a horror story stemming from the Gothic examples of Edgar Allan Poe and Mary Shelley. You know that Poe wrote uh, The Telltale Heart, those kinds of stories. Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein. Gothic horror fiction has certain characteristics. 
It's normally set in a creepy old house, and the story is set in a creepy old house. It has an atmosphere of mystery, suspense, and fear. Completely true here. The plot is built around a mystery. What's going on with the woman? It features supernatural elements such as ghosts. So the women outside and the women or the woman in the wallpaper are ghosts. The characters have heightened emotions. That certainly is true. And it often features a woman in distress due to an overbearing or tyrannical male. So when Charlotte Perkins Gilman published this, people said, okay, you know, it's just another horror story. You know, it's, it's cool, but it's really not a big deal. In the 1970s, the story was also recognized as a feminist narrative worthy of historical and literary scholarship. And that's the reason why I chose it. Because now it is not read as a horror story, though of course it is a horror story. It's read as what happens to many women for reasons that are often not in their control. The wallpaper design serves as symbolic imagery of the imprisonment of women much as the narrator is a prisoner in her own home. By adhering to the patriarchal expectations regarding women's behavior, women are prevented from personal and artistic growth. Just as an aside, I had a meeting today at the college. The meeting was run by two women. There were five women present and one man. The two women running the meeting addressed all of their questions to the men. And I, I was astonished by this. And I broke in and I said, we're here as well. They did it completely unconsciously. The story takes place in the Victorian era, the late 1890, in 1892. Uh, Victoria was the queen, and hence it's called the Victorian era. In that time, the social context was the woman's role was as a wife and a mother. Women couldn't vote. They couldn't own property. Women were supposed to be pure, pious, religious, domestic, and submissive. Women could not live on their own. Their husbands and fathers had to serve as their guardians. This picture that I have really exemplifies it. Notice her adoring gaze, her submissive posture. Notice he is standing there holding a tool. We could get symbolic, but I'm gonna let that one go by. Notice the child, the angelic looking child. They're surrounded by a bower of flowers, greenery. And he is holding her close because he is her protector. That was the role. Now, what's ironic and interesting about this, that was the role only for upper middle class and wealthy women. Poor women had to go to work and were not expected to be pure, pious, domestic, or submissive. They were expected to work on plantations, in coal mines, as servants, and often were the sole supporters of their family, their husbands having been killed, having left, uh, having been disabled. Laura Ingalls Wilder, who wrote Little House on the Prairie books, you may know those books, they're charming. She married Almanzo, he was 10 years older. They were married a very short time. Almanzo got diphtheria and was paralyzed partially and never ever regained his strength. She, they lived on a farm in Missouri. They were very, very poor. And she supported them through her writing. Before she could make it with the Little House book, she wrote about raising chickens and apples, growing apples. So if you were wealthy or if you were upper middle class, you fit right into this social construct. If you were poor, none of this mattered. You worked. For the women who had enough money and were married to men who could support them, what we see is the woman is what was called the angel in the household. 
And this picture, which comes from a book called The Wide, Wide World, is very typical. She is an angelic presence protecting her children. John's profession as a doctor heightens the irony of his inability to understand his wife's suffering and the time period's dismissal of mental illness in general. You know that people who had mental illness were almost always shunted away, locked up, even tortured. There was no treatment for people who had mental illness. And it is ironic and it is tragic that even though John loves her very much, he is totally unable to understand how much she is suffering. The presence of the narrator's infant hints that the narrator is suffering from postpartum depression, which Gilman also experienced. So the story is highly autobiographical. Gilman received treatment from a well-known and well-respected physician who was Silas Weir Mitchell. Her husband loved her deeply and got her basically the number one doctor who dealt with postpartum. And the treatment was called the rest cure. And the rest cure, you were isolated from your friends and family. You had a special diet. You had massages and electrotherapy. The diet was baby foods. It was um, stuff like farina, scrambled eggs, a very, very soft, innocuous diet. There would be nothing involving tomato sauce or salsa or meat or anything like that. You were fed basically baby food. And then you've got electrotherapy. As one of the medical and scientific experts who debated the woman question, Mitchell defended the notion of significant differences between the sexes and argued that an epidemic of nervous exhaustion was rife among women who attempted to exceed their natural limits. The argument was that women had smaller brains than men, which of course is true because most women are smaller than men, so everything is smaller. But because their brains were smaller, they could not hold much knowledge. And also because they had a uterus, they were prone to hysteria hysterectomy, hyster the uterus. And so women suffered from, um, they called it the fantods, they called it nervous exhaustion, that they simply could not take too much learning. You couldn't let a woman read or write because it would strain her. And again, if you were poor, none of this held true. If you're not familiar with electrotherapy, and I certainly hope you are not, this was a device that had a series of small batteries with two clasps at either end. You would apply the electrodes to the offending areas and you would get an electric current. It appeared at the first World's Fair at the Crystal Palace in London in 1851, and it became very, very trendy. About 50,000 people a year reportedly plugged in. And they would put it on different parts of your body. I'll leave that to your imagination. And you would get these titillating, these exciting electric currents. So women who were suffering from postpartum or nervous depression were treated with this soft diet, no work at all, boredom, and electrotherapy. This is another picture that shows that idyllic mother and child. The notion being that all women immediately know how to take care of babies. All women want babies and it's a natural process. I found it very difficult to learn how to take care of babies. It was not natural in the least. Jenny, John's sister, easy acceptance of her domestic role increases the narrator's guilt over her own dissatisfaction with the domestic role she has been forced into. As the narrator's isolation and idleness increase, so does her obsession with the wallpaper. Her obsession with the wallpaper 
may symbolize her inability to express her need to be creative and active. The wallpaper's puzzling patterns symbolize the narrator's increasing depression. She sees the wallpaper as unclean, ill, and ugly. The woman trapped behind the pattern can be seen as a double of the narrator, as both are trapped. That's called a doppelganger. The narrator's casually stated plan to burn the house shows how very ill she is. It seems to her perfectly logical to burn down the house. It, she's not aware that she'd be killing people. Like the woman in the wallpaper, the narrator is trapped, desperate to escape the grasp of her sickness, but also the grasp of the society and her husband who represents that traditional society that has forced her into this room because of its views of women and mental illness. The suspense mounts as the narrator's imminent breakdown approaches. John and Jenny still have not grasped the seriousness of her fixation on the wallpaper. Even when Jenny discovers the narrator halfway through her mission, she laughingly assumes it is a simple hatred of the pattern. If any of you have ever known anybody who is seriously mentally ill, um, they often appear to get better if they decide to kill themselves. Her idea of suicide is terrifyingly casual and how she dismisses it, that it might be improper or misconstrued is an indictment of society's notion of propriety. As the narrator descends completely into a mental breakdown, she now sees herself as the woman behind the wallpaper the rest cure enforced on her by her society and husband has driven her to this breakdown. And it's, it's a terrible irony because her husband loves her, gets her the best doctor and truly thinks as a physician himself that he is doing the best possible thing that he could ever do for her. As his wife's mental breakdown is complete, John is forced to confront it directly. His fainting marks a departure from his traditional male role of strength and self-control and suggests that he too has been constrained by his social role in a way that weakens him. And that's part of the genius of this story. John is not a bad man, far from it. He is acting in accordance with society. He is acting with great love. He is as trapped as she is. He is trapped by his training as a physician. He is trapped by society telling him that he must act in a certain way. And that if he were to act differently, he would not be a good husband or a good father. So Gilman balances both the male and the female roles to show how society had constrained everyone. I had read earlier, Jane. Some critics think that the mention of Jane is a misprint of Jenny, but others argue that it suggests the narrator is named Jane. She has become so disassociated from her sane self that she refers to herself in the third person, having become the woman in the wall. She has no name. She's always the narrator. This tantalizing clue of Jane is all that we have. So that gives her a universality. She is every woman who has ever had postpartum, every woman who has felt, even without mental illness, constrained by the roles that society has given her. My father, who was a wonderful man, and I loved him dearly, told me that my husband would leave me if I got a PhD because I would have more education than he had. The fact that we're together close to 50 years suggests he's not going anywhere. But my father honestly believed that it was a very bad idea for me to get more education than my husband. There's a picture of Charlotte Perkins Gilman 
the first duty of a human being is to assume the right functional relationship to society. More briefly, to find your real job and do it. She was a writer, a lecturer, and a feminist who fought for women's rights in a society, in society and in the home. She wrote prolifically on the subject of women's issues, especially focusing on the inequality of women by challenging the basis for women's restricted role in society. She had a miserable childhood. She was born July 3rd, 1860 in Hartford, Connecticut. Her father, Frederick Beecher Perkins, was a relative of the well-known and influential Beecher family. However, if you know that the old line, uh, he went out for a pack of cigarettes and never came back, he simply left. He chose not to be a father or a husband, and he left the mother to raise the children. Now, remember, she couldn't get a job. There, there was really nothing open to her or very little. So what she did, Mama, Charlotte, and the brother, they often lived with the father's aunts. Isabella Beecher Hooker, who was a suffragist, and Harriet Beecher Stowe, the author of Uncle Tom's Cabin, and Catherine Beecher, an educational reformer. So from a very early age, Charlotte Perkins Gilman learned, number one, you can't depend upon a man to support you because her father left. And number two, from her aunts, she learned about women's rights. Harriet Beecher Stowe, you, you probably know the line, uh, she was very short, very short. And when she met Abraham Lincoln, who was very tall, he said to her, so you're the little bitty women, woman who started this great big war. Because of course, Uncle Tom's Cabin had been a catalyst for support for the uh, abolitionist movement. Her schooling was erratic. She attended seven different schools for just four years. And she ended when she was 15 years old. Her mother was not affectionate with her children. In her autobiography, Gilman wrote that her mother showed affection only when she thought her young daughter was asleep. Although she lived a childhood of isolated, impoverished loneliness, she often went to the public library and studied ancient civilizations. I have to break in here for a second and thank Senator Brooks, who has always been a staunch supporter of public libraries. And I put this in here as homage to him. Many, many people with sad and lonely childhoods find uh, refuge in libraries and they educate themselves. She supported herself as an artist and a tutor. Now remember, writing, tutoring, there wasn't a lot open for women. She married Charles Stetson in 1884. There's a picture of them. A year later, their daughter Catherine was born. And as we said, she had severe postpartum depression. She was suicidal. She left her husband. She moved to Southern California with her daughter. They live with their friend, Grace Ellery Channing. That's Grace Ellery Channing there. She literally, actually legally separated from her husband. And that was extremely rare. You could live apart, but to divorce was, was virtually unheard of. They divorced in 94. And Stetson married Channing. Gilman fixed them up. Gilman said to her friend, I, I think you'd be happy with my husband, and said to her ex-husband, I think you'd be happy with my friend. And they got married. In California, she became active in feminist and reformist organizations. In 1894, she sent her daughter back east to live with her former husband and his second wife. She reported in her memoir that she was happy for the couple since Catherine's, quote, second mother was fully as good as the first, and perhaps better in some ways. And most interestingly, she had very progressive views about parental rights and acknowledged that her ex-husband had a right to some of Catherine's society and that Catherine had a right to know and love her father. Again, extremely unusual that a mother would willingly relinquish her daughter, or any of her children, and have her husband 
raise the child. You can imagine what people said about that. In 1893, she moved back east. She got in touch with her first cousin, Houghton Gilman. He was a Wall Street attorney, and she hadn't seen him in 15 years, and that's his picture. They quickly became romantically involved. They married in 1900, and they were happy. They were very happy together. He died suddenly in 1934, and she moved back to California where her daughter was living. Her daughter was very close to her mother. She held no ill will about what had happened. And so did her friend. I mean, they, they were all very close. In 1932, she had been uh, diagnosed with incurable breast cancer, an advocate of euthanasia for the terminally ill. She died by suicide on August 17, 1935 after taking an overdose of chloroform. Absolutely remarkable woman, okay? While she is best known for her fiction, Gilman was also a successful lecturer and intellectual. One of her greatest works of nonfiction, Women in Economics, was published in 1898. A feminist, she called for women to gain economic independence, and the work helped cement her standing as a social theorist. Before we started, I was telling Senator Brooks and his staff that one of the things she advocated is that houses did not come with kitchens because she did not think anybody should have to cook. She felt that people should live in sort of a communal kind of situation with a communal kitchen and hire someone, pay them, and have them do all the cooking, uh, like a kibbutz. Same thing with laundry, cleaning, and everything. And here is my last slide. Doctor, there's a woman in the wallpaper. That woman has a feminist agenda. Tell her to get in the wallpaper that's in the kitchen. Okay. So let's see if I can get back on. All righty. Okay. Questions? Comments? Okay. Thank you so much. Sorry. Joyce? I we yeah. do have the Q and A um, open if anyone wants to submit any questions. I do see someone's raise. Uh, Thank you, Jana. Them. Joyce. I see Joyce has raised her hand. Joe, do you want to um, let her unmute so she can ask her question? Thank you, Robin. I appreciate that. Joyce? Uh, Joyce, oh, you are I, muted if you want to go ahead. Thank you. Can you hear me now? We yeah. can. OK, I don't know why you can't see my face. But the way I look now, it's no problem. Um, <laughs> I look really disheveled. I want to thank you so much for opening my eyes up to this woman I never heard of. Um, I'm a freelance writer, and um, oh. uh, which is another word for being unemployed many times. Uh, but I really am very involved and, and happy to learn about this feminist person who I will research and look for. Would you be able to put up the, the book, uh, her, the title of the book again, uh, that the story? I would be very it? happy to share the entire presentation. Senator Brooks, you can do with it as you please. Um, if, okay. if people want to, you know, if you can post it somewhere, you can do whatever and people can reference it. This is a very, it's a very brief story. It's, you know, maybe eight or 10 pages. And it's her most famous work. It's, it's amazing. In the, it's in the public domain. You can get it for free it, uh, right online. Um, it's in many, many different sites. You know, just, just Google it. I use Gutenberg. I don't know if you know the site Gutenberg, but Gutenberg has a lot of public domain pieces. So for example, the poetry of Walt Whitman is all in Gutenberg, but this is completely available for free right on Gutenberg. So you can just download it and you know, read it at your leisure. And it's available on Google Docs? I don't know about Google Docs, but the site I've used is called Gutenberg. Um, let's see, do you think you could possibly, because I know I'll, I'll goof it, you know, if you could find, just go to Gutenberg and just put the link in. Okay, thank you. Sure. Sure. But again, it, it's public domain, so it's available 
on many different places. You don't you don't have to purchase anything. Um, Thank you, you very much. Sure. It's very yeah. informative and enjoyable. Well, I think that many of us, even today, feel that we are uh, expected to to do act in certain ways. We're expected, perhaps, to have children. You know, uh, we are expected, perhaps, to do the cooking, to do the cleaning, and if we're not expected to, perhaps we feel that there's maybe something wrong with these patterns. Now, I know people who don't. I, I know families where the men do the cooking, which I think is absolutely wonderful. But I mean, in Joyce, in your family, is, you know, is this a commonplace thing? I don't know. But I, I know that for many, many women, the expectation is still there that we act a certain way. We do have, um, Dr. Lori, a question in the Q&A box. Um, sure. Yara asked, uh, how do you think the issue of women's mental health is approached today? Um, I find it incredibly relevant still as described in the novel. Uh, first of all, I think that things like fibromyalgia, which affect women more than men, I think they're dismissed. I think that um, Lyme disease, you know, things that, that is a great question, by the way, that women tend to get more than men. I don't think they're taken very seriously. I think that we fortunately do take postpartum more seriously. I think we're, we're very aware of that now. And I think that there are um, definitely more treatments, but I still think that women's illness is not treated as seriously as men's illnesses are. Um, I, I don't know how, how you guys agree with me on that one. Okay, you do, Janet. Yeah, but my experience has been that, especially with things like heart attacks, we all know that a man, if a man gets a heart attack, he normally gets pain in his throat, down his left arm, and across his chest. Women do not present like that. Women will often get nauseous and break out in a sweat. They often don't get that, but that's not as commonly known. We're all told about the men's symptoms. So a woman who perhaps feels nauseous may think, well, whatever it is, she's having a heart attack, but she's not presenting like a man. So I think even in those, and women get heart attacks just as frequently as men do. So I think it's very, very unfortunately, but I think we haven't gotten past that yet. Um, and I think mental illness, fortunately for people like, um, I'm trying to think who, who would name me some stars who've really helped demystify it. Carter, Rosalind Carter has written books about mental illness. She has helped a lot to demystify it. Betty Ford helped with uh, drug and alcohol abuse. Uh, Happy Rockefeller helped with mastectomies a um, couple of others, but we're still not getting enough people coming out and sharing their experiences with things like mental illness, with things like suicide attempts, with things like postpartum, with uh, issues that affect women and not men. So that's only my opinion, but based on the people that I know, um, I think it's a, it's a really sad kind of thing. You know, we've come we've come a long way, baby, as the commercial said, but we still have a lot of inequalities in healthcare. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lori. I don't see any more questions, um, but I'll turn it over to Sia or Senator Brooks for any uh, closing remarks. Not sure if anyone else uh, had anything. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, before Senator Brooks does his closing remarks, I just want to say thank you, Dr. Rosaski. This was a wonderful, amazing interpretation and discussion of the yellow wallpaper. It was really beautiful, read, and um, you know, very knowledgeable. Really enjoy it. And um, thank you for this wonderful literature and storytelling. It was such a wealth of information. Thank you again for taking your time to really discuss uh, and interpret this particular story. Thank you. Now I'm going to turn it to Senator Brooks for his closing remarks. Thanks again. Thank you. All right, let's see if I do this right. <laughs> I don't, I guess, I guess we'll leave the screen the way it is. Um, 
first, uh, Doctor, I thank you very, very much for the uh, presentation. Thank you, sir. Um, and the opportunity for people to um, to be driven to think, as I look at it. Um, I certainly, I'm, I'm going to segue a, a, a little bit. Uh, you met with your, your boss, or John, during the day. John and I, I think, had five conversations during the course of the day, uh, the way things worked out on some stuff. But I think, um, you know, this is uh, education is something that uh, never ends. And, and, and I say that only because a program like this gives people an opportunity to think, to comment, uh, to learn, to research. Uh, so I think, um, you know, as we take time to honor the history of women, those that made a difference and, and recognize uh, as we go through life, we often face different challenges um, as, as, we, as we had a discussion of this evening. Um, and I think sharing uh, the writer in, in the sense, sharing what she is going through or went through during, during the, the, the process is very important because we learn from that. Uh, and sometimes, um, you know, we understand what's happening to ourselves better and, and um, can help ourselves mend ourselves, if that's the, the right, the right place of phraseology. Uh, so, I, so I think this is very important. And um, I, I think, uh, I hope, I hope people enjoyed the discussion that, uh, that took place and, and the, uh, the reference to other sources of material that was given in terms of what you can pull down off the uh, the internet, uh, Doctor. I thank you for for sharing uh, your comments on this and and the opportunity for some people to hear and discuss um, this particular uh, work. Uh, as as someone who is colorblind, I always use that as an excuse on certain things. Yellow is one of the colors I can see. Um, <laughs> But um, you know, I I I've long ago given up wallpaper on the wall. <laughs> um, but uh, I I thank you very much, and and I would uh, I thank the staff um, for their uh, their assistance on the program, and and uh, Doctor Ed, I would want to give you the opportunity for any other closing remarks you might want to make. Well, I just want to add. I, I think you you're phenomenal. The thing that shocked me about the meeting today was it was the women addressing the man. It, it wasn't a man doing anything. The, the man was just sitting there. The women gave him the deference and ignored the other women. So I think that sometimes we can be our own worst enemies. I think a lot of men, and I count you among this, I count my husband among this, are very aware of these issues and go to great lengths to give equality and to address men and women equally, to address men and women fairly, but women often don't. And that's the irony of this. You know, her husband was trying very hard to help her, but, you know, he was trapped. So, you know, uh, I find the college president to be very fair, very even handed, and um, our provost is a woman. So, you know, we, we are doing a good job at the college. I think it's society as a whole where we still have our problems. Well, I, you know, I, I, I would just add to that is sometimes, and this applies to all of us in some ways, we have certain types of behavior that that have just been a part of life. You're right. And and as we as we move through life, um, you know, we 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 look that way. It'll be interesting uh, the first time we have a female president, and I say the first time we will have, because we will, uh, how she will be addressed and and respected and when we get into a crisis during her presidency, because we always seem to do that, mm -hmm. um, will she be treated different? Right. Will the expectations for her be different? So I think, you know, we, some people have, have uh, set perceptions and, and to the point of your meeting, um, 
it's it's just a practice to to, to do that. It, right. It's and it was it's more of a built-in reaction versus a thought process. I think you're right. Uh, yeah. So, is it going to be your granddaughter? What's that? Is it going to be your granddaughter, the first president, female president? Oh, I I hope. Uh, I think uh, she sees what I sometimes go through in this job. Uh, so I hope she's being educated not to walk <laughs> those, those roadways sometimes. I mean, you know, certainly these are trying times, and yes. and and um, yes, you know, we need to help people, and and sometimes expectations are exceptionally high. And and right now, with some of the things, the pandemic, just as an example, finding a real solution is difficult. That's exactly right. And, um, yeah. you know, it's frustrating. Exactly. Um, but, uh, you know, I think we, yeah. my, my job, I feel, is to try to do my best, be honest, and, and that's, that's it, you know? And, and I, don't, I don't mean that in a flippant way. Yeah. I do try to listen to people and all. And I think, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, what you went through tonight, uh, the presentation you gave, the review is, for people to have an opportunity to think and and um, and weigh some of the challenges they face in life. So I, so I think it's good. I think these the concept of having discussions this whole month I hope are eye opening for people and they enjoy it. And um, you know we'll see how it all works out. Thank you so much for doing this. My pleasure. I thank the staff. They do a they do a great job. You have a you have a great staff. Yeah, that I know. That yeah. I know. Yeah. Thank you again, Dr. Lori. It was uh, a pleasure to hear from you and learn from you uh, this evening. We thank all the attendees for joining us. Um, Lucy, I'll turn to you uh, if you had any anything to say. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Melody, Senator Brooks, and Dr. Um, Rostakis, and everyone for joining us today. Thank you for being with us um, again. And I just want to say to please, um, I encourage you to join us for the upcoming series we have uh, for the whole month of um of March, you know, we will be having this wonderful history month, which is an opportunity, as you will know, to remember the incredible accomplishments and contributions of women throughout our history. So please stay tuned, uh, go to Senator Brooks social media, um, Facebook, um, and also you could go to um, his website, um, as well as um, our office, you could always call our office if you have any questions at 516-882-0630. And again, thank you for joining us tonight. Have a blessed evening. Thank you. Thank you.